Heavenly Father, as we turn to your word this evening, we pray for a fresh anointing upon me as I come to share from your word, and a fresh anointing upon our ears as we hear, that Lord, we would hear from you, and Lord, you would guide our understanding, that we would come away with a clear picture of what you want to say to us, and know, Lord, how to uh, apply these things to our lives, so that, Lord, we might be able to live to your honour and your glory. In Jesus' name, Amen. Okay, then. Let's turn in our Bibles to Revelation chapter 12. Monday evenings when I'm teaching, I'm going through the book of Revelation. And uh, last time we got halfway through chapter 12 of Revelation. We're going to finish that chapter this evening. Right, now what I'd like to do before we actually launch into the various verses we're going to be going through, um, I would like just to do a quick uh, revision so that we can understand exactly where we stand in the Word of God. There's a few new people here this evening. I don't want anybody to, anybody to be too lost. So first of all, God's Word has a, a wonderful design to it, and every individual book has a design and a pattern to it, and it is a signature of the author behind it. Our God is a God of order, not a God of chaos. And so let's just look at the book of Revelation and understand its design. It is made up of a series of sevens. The first seven is seven churches. Uh, this seven churches is then followed by an interval or an interlude. And then it is followed by seven seals. Those seven seals are then followed by an interlude. And that interlude is then followed by seven trumpets in the narrative. The narrative is then continued with a further interlude and then that interlude is followed by seven signs. And then those seven signs are followed by an interlude. And that interlude is followed by a further seven. This is seven bowls. And then a final interlude is included. So that is the basic structure or design of the book of Revelation. And you, I think you can already see clearly how neatly it is laid out and how God's order is demonstrated in this. Now added to this, we have an introduction and we see that in the introduction, which is chapter one, we see John, the Apostle John, late in life, uh, exiled on the Isle of Patmos. There he sees a vision of the resurrected Christ. And it is from that place of incarceration on the Isle of Patmos that everything else within the book of Revelation was revealed to him. He recorded it down for us so that we could have it for our Bible study uh, this evening. And just as it's topped, it's tailed and it has a conclusion. And at the end of the book of Revelation, after this layout has been completed, we see the second coming of Jesus Christ. We see the millennium, that is Jesus Christ, return to the earth and establish his rule and reign upon the earth for a period of a thousand years. And after that time, we see what's called the great white throne judgment, where sinners are judged for their sins and they're cast into the lake of fire. And then uh, the final consummation of all things is that God will create a new, well, there'll be a new heaven and a new earth where all the redeemed of God will live with the Lord for all eternity. So this is the layout of the book of Revelation. And I hope this gives you some understanding of where we're going. Um, just to go into it a little bit more detail. The, the book of Revelation is, uh, was written at the end of the first century by the Apostle John. But what it details is the entire period of human history from heaven's perspective from that time at the end of the first century right up to the consummation of the age. So we've got the complete history of mankind from roughly 100 AD up to the new heaven and new earth included in the book of Revelation. Now the seven churches that we see in the first couple of chapters, chapters two and three of the book of Revelation, give us details about seven actual churches that were in existence in John's day at, um, at the end of the first century. And each of these seven churches have different characteristics uh, surrounding them. But prophetically speaking, these seven churches talk about the church age. This is the age where the church was birthed 
at the day of Pentecost and when the church will be removed via an event called the rapture, when the Lord will come to gather his church, uh, just the same way that in, uh, in Israeli marriage, the bridegroom would come and collect his bride and take, uh, take his church back to heaven. And the church age can be characterised as in different stages. And if you look back upon church history, you can see that there were different stages in church history, each with a different characteristic attached to them. And the dominant characteristic of, of those church ages matches the characteristic of the seven churches spoken of in Revelation uh, 2 to 3. Now, that period of time is approximately going to be about 2,000 years. And uh, we see that we're not the church has been around for a few decades short of 2,000 years, which tells me that the um, time of Jesus Christ's return is not very far away at all. The dominant, dominant characteristic of the church of this age is of the church of Laodicea, which is the seventh and final church that is spoken of in Revelation chapter 3. So the time that we're getting late in time, and so the events that we are going to see portrayed and told about in the book of Revelation aren't very far away from us whatsoever. Now, if we move on to the uh, seven seals, the seven trumpets, the seven signs and the seven bowls, these are events that occur during a period of time that is typically called the tribulation. Now, the tribulation it lasts for seven years. And what happens is that after the church is removed to be with the Lord in heaven, there's a period of seven years upon the earth where God's wrath is poured out upon the earth. And we see that wrath being illustrated or described to us in the book of Revelation through these seven seals, these seven trumpets and the seven bowls. Now, following the uh, seven years of the tribulation and described in the conclusion of the book, we have the millennium, which I've already told you about, is the thousand year reign of Jesus Christ when he returns to the earth with his church to reign upon the earth for a thousand years. And then following the millennium, we have the eternal state with the new heaven and the new earth where all the redeemed of the Lord live with the earth on this new earth. And that is a time without end that goes into eternity, hence the eternal state. So we see that the book of book Revelation also gives us a, a history lesson of what the future holds. And we are right in that point towards the end of the church age, close to the beginning of the tribulation. Now, looking at the content of the book of Revelation, the majority of its contents is involved with talking to us about those seven years of tribulation. That is the principal focus of this book. We can find out more about the other periods of time in uh, that are detailed in this book elsewhere in scripture. But this is where our focus is uh, uh, as we go into the book of Revelation. Now, I've given you here the references to those various sections of the book of Revelation. So you can see which chapters correspond to which segments of the book. And again, you can see the design, the beauty of God's word contained here. And where we have got to at this moment in time, being in Revelation chapter 12, is this section here. We are looking at the seven signs. Now, the events of the Great Tribulation are first introduced to us through these seven signs. And these seven signs are basically the cast of the Great Tribulation. And uh, if we can just move forward, as we go forward and looking at these seven signs of Revelation, we see that we focus in upon the seven, the seven years of the tribulation, and it is actually divided into two halves, the, into two halves of three and a half years. The first three and a half years is typically called the beginning of sorrows. The second three and a half years is called the great tribulation. And we can see that the seven seals and the seven trumpets largely happen in the first half, and the seven signs and the seven bowls happen in the second half. So we are right here at the midpoint of the tribulation in chapter 12, and we are looking at these seven signs. What have I done here? I think I've done the slide twice. How clever. OK, then. Now, these seven signs are the main cast of the Great Tribulation, the main players throughout this second period 
of three and a half years. And to date, we have looked at four of these signs in uh, chapters one to, uh, sorry, in verses one to six of chapter 12, we have looked at a woman clothed with the sun, a great red dragon, a male child, and the archangel Michael. Now let's just reread these verses so that we can refresh our memory. Verses one to two of Revelation 12 says, Now a great sign appeared in heaven, a woman clothed with the sun, with the moon under her feet, and on her head a garland of twelve stars. Then being with child, she cried out in labour and in pain to give birth. Now this first sign speaks of the nation of Israel. Uh, and uh, Israel is the first player of the Great Tribulation these last three and a half years. And in these verses, we see that the woman is heavily pregnant. Contractions have begun. Birth is imminent. And the child that is being birthed by the woman, we will later see, is Jesus Christ. And of course, Jesus Christ came from the nation of Israel. We come on to the second sign, the dragon, that's spoken of in verses three and four, where it says, And another sign appeared in heaven. Behold, a great fiery dread dragon, having seven heads and ten horns and seven diadems on his heads. His tail drew a third of the stars of heaven and threw them to the earth, and the dragon stood before the woman who was ready to give birth to devour her child as soon as it was born. And last time we saw that this red dragon is none other than Satan. Satan is the second player of the Great Tribulation. And this dragon, or Satan, is portrayed in all his ferocious power and murderous nature, standing before the woman, ready to devour her child. And as, we've, and as we will see, this child is Jesus Christ. And, and Satan sought to murder Jesus at his birth, you remember, with the massacre of the innocents, where Herod, demonically inspired, sought to kill all the boys under the age of two in Bethlehem. Uh, but Satan, uh, but uh, Jesus was able to escape down to Egypt. But Satan continually sought to kill Jesus throughout his earthly ministry, of course. And this shows us the true nature of Satan, that he is a murderer right from the beginning. Then we read about the third sign, the male child in verse five, where it says, And she bore a male child who was to rule all nations with a rod of iron, and her child was caught up to God and to his throne. So the third player of this second half of uh, the tribulation is Jesus Christ himself. And we're told two things about Jesus in this verse. We're told about something about his past and something about his future. The thing we're told about his past is his ascension. He was caught up to God and to his throne. And the future thing we're told about his destiny is he will rule all nations with a rod of iron. And with his ascension, we see that Jesus Christ escapes escaped Satan's murderous grasp. Satan was not able to destroy the male child. But with his destiny, when Jesus Christ comes to rule all nations with a rod of iron, this is when he'll come to rule the earth for a thousand years, the millennium, he will have a final victory over Satan and Satan will be fully defeated. Now the fourth uh, character of the um, uh, or the fourth sign, who will be the fourth player in the uh, Great Tribulation, is the Archangel Michael. We read about him in verses 7 and 9. So, verses 7 and 9, uh, it says, And war broke out in heaven. Michael and his angels fought against the dragon, and the dragon and his angels fought. But they did not prevail, nor was a place found for them in heaven any longer. So the great dragon was cast out, that serpent of old called the devil and Satan, who deceives the whole world. He was cast to the earth and his angels were cast out with him. So this fourth player, the Archangel Michael, is, uh, is, uh, comes onto the scene at the midpoint of the tribulation where war breaks out in heaven. And Michael and his angels fight against the dragon and his angels. And Michael, hallelujah, is the victor, victor. And as a result, the dragon and his angels are cast down to the earth. They no longer have access to heaven. And as we go forward into our study this evening, we're going to see the fallout of Michael's victory. We're going to see the fallout or the consequences of Michael's victory. Now, if you want any more detail about these uh, first four signs, you'll have to go back to my former study. 
but uh, that serves us for our purposes this evening on PowerPoint. Uh, now let's press on with our, our new text and um, let's read verses 10 to 17 so we get an idea of the overall sweep. It says, Then I heard a loud voice saying in heaven, Now salvation and strength and the kingdom of our God and the power of his Christ have come. For the accuser of our brethren who accused them before our God day and night has been cast down. And they overcame him by the blood of the Lamb and by the word of their testimony. And they did not love their lives to the death. Therefore rejoice, O heavens, and you who dwell in them. Woe to the inhabitants of the earth and sea. For the devil has come down to you having great wrath, because he knows that he has a short time. Now, when the dragon saw that he had been cast to the earth, he persecuted the woman who gave birth to the male child. But the woman was given two wings of a great eagle, that she might fly into the wilderness to her place, where she is nourished for a time and times and a half time from the presence of the serpent. So the serpent spewed of water out of his mouth like a flood after the woman, that he might cause her to be carried away by the flood. But the earth helped the woman, and the earth opened its mouth and swallowed up the flood which the dragon had spewed out of his mouth. And the dragon was enraged with the woman, and he went to make war with the rest of her offspring, who keep the commandments of God, and have the testimony of Jesus Christ. So, following this war in heaven, where Michael and his angels have victory over the dragon and his angels, and the dragon, who is Satan, gets cast down to the earth in the middle of the tribulation. We will see uh, a, a tremendous fallout. Uh, now, most Christians don't spend a great deal of time considering the work of angels, uh, and I think that's because they largely operate in the hidden realm, and the effect of their ministry is largely concealed. But here we gain a rare glimpse into the work of angels on our behalf. They fight and defend us from the attacks of Satan and the effects of their work is felt both in heaven and on the earth in this case. Just one second, please. Now, the effect or the fallout of Satan's victory and of, of, sorry, of Michael's victory and of Satan and his angels fall to the earth is twofold. There are two chief consequences. The first is there's rejoicing in heaven. And the second fallout is there's persecution on earth. And this is what's detailed in these next couple of verses. We read in Revelation 12, 12, woe to the inhabitants of the earth and the sea. When Satan and his angels are cast down to the earth, the heaven, heaven is freed of its curse, yet earth faces its greatest curse it's ever faced for three and a half years because Satan and all of his fallen angels are there on the earth. And when Satan falls to the earth, it is with great wrath pumping through his veins and he will bring deception and death to all that he can. And we read again, Then I heard a loud voice saying in heaven, Now salvation and strength and the kingdom of our God and the accuser of our brethren who accused them before our God day and night has been cast down. So this is the first response to Michael's victory. It is a victory cry from heaven that the accuser of our brethren has been cast down. And the question is, to whom does this voice belong? Well, we have a number of beings in heaven to whom it could belong. We have the angels, the cherubim, seraphim and living creatures. Uh, but we also have the Old Testament saints, the New Testament saints, i.e. the Church of Jesus Christ. And we have the martyr tribulation saints in heaven. But when we read, look carefully at these words, we can tell that it is the voice of the redeemed of God. Because neither an angel nor God would describe Satan as the accuser of our brethren. This is a personal benefit derived from the fall of Satan in heaven. And so this is the voice of the redeemed rejoicing that Satan is no longer present in heaven. And when we look into heaven today, we will see two beings standing there, the accuser and the advocate. The accuser of the brethren is Satan. The advocate of the brethren is Jesus Christ. 
And for 6,000 years, Satan has stood in heaven as our accuser, accusing the faithful servants of the Most High, pointing out their sin, their failures, highlighting their shame and their guilt. And who here among us hasn't felt the accusation and condemnation of Satan in their lives at one point or another? But from this point forward in uh, the, the tribulation, because Satan is cast out of heaven, that accusation ends. Hallelujah. Satan is cast out of heaven, never to return. return. Hence the redeemed cry out, salvation and strength. And that word uh, translated salvation in my Bible could also be translated deliverance. And who here, having been weighed down by guilt and shame brought on by the enemy, has not felt the blessed relief of deliverance and salvation, has not felt the renewed strength in their being when victory has been won and Satan has been cast out. And this is the sensation and the source of rejoicing in heaven, that sense of deliverance. Now today we still have that accuser to contend with. And I know that God's servant Job felt the weight of that accusation and he cried out for a mediator in Job 9.33. The Apostle Paul revealed that there is one mediator between God and men, the man Christ Jesus, in 1 Timothy 2.5. And the writer to the Hebrews told us, he, that is our mediator, our advocate, advocate, Jesus Christ, always lives to make intercession for them. In Hebrews 7.25, we have an advocate in heaven who is pleading our cause even today. And the Apostle John wrote in his letter, 1 John 2.1, we have an advocate with the Father, Jesus Christ the righteous. Jesus is constantly standing in the gap for us, defending us, arguing for us, protecting us, shepherding us. He is there now, pleading our cause. Hallelujah, that we have such a wonderful Saviour. Now we read about the testimony of the redeemed in heaven. They say in... Uh, Verse 11, and they overcame him by the blood of the lamb and by the word of their testimony, and they did not love their lives to death. Faced with the accusations of Satan, the redeemed in heaven declare there are three ways they overcame the accuser to secure victory from his condemnation. And these are three ways that we can overcome the accusations and the condemnation of the devil today. They are the blood of the lamb, the word of our testimony, and not loving our lives. Let's look at the blood of the Lamb. They overcame him by the blood of the Lamb. The first way the redeemed secure victory over the enemy's accusations is through a dependence on and a reliance on the blood of the Lamb. Now what do I mean by the blood of the Lamb? Well first and foremost it's not some mystical potion whereby we declare the blood of Jesus and suddenly we are set free. It is a reference to the atoning work of Jesus Christ upon the cross. It's a, short her, it's a shorthand term to talk about that time when Jesus offered his life in substitution for ours. He bore the full penalty of our sin and the wrath of heaven was poured out upon him so it does not need to be poured out upon us. And then through his death and resurrection, a satisfaction for sin was met and a victory over sin was secured. And all who put their faith and trust in Jesus Christ and work upon their cross, all those who um, put their faith in the blood of the Lamb, can be healed of a troubled conscience, can know that their sins have been forgiven and washed away. They can know that they are saved and they are sons of God, members of the family of God. And they can know that they have the righteousness of Christ in place of the condemnation of sin, and thus they have access into the presence of God. That takes away the accusations of the enemy and puts us in a place of peace and right relationship with God. Now, declaring the blood of Jesus over a person or a situation, I, I question whether that really achieves anything. It's, it almost seems like a superstitious, superstitious chant, um, much like white rabbit or something like that. When we say, when we talk about the blood of Jesus, we are declaring Jesus' death, burial and resurrection. And it means a deliverance from sin, a deliverance from Satan, a deliverance from the world and a deliverance from judgment. And it's our understanding and our faith in the act which brings deliverance, not some magical incantation 
of a phrase. The second way that um, you can overcome the accusations of the Satan of Satan is they overcame him by the word of their testimony. And it is through the word of our testimony that we can fend off the accusations of the, of the devil. We often forget how powerful our personal testimony is. But if we recall to ourselves the way that God's hand is operated in our life, that can lift us out of that place of condemnation and guilt. If we think about the, t the words that God has spoken into our lives, the prayers he has answered, the paths he has led you on, the victories he has given you, the revelation he has imparted to you, all these things contribute to an effective defence against the accuser of the brethren. But this is also another reason why it is so important for us to have fellowship with one another, because it's not only the word of our individual testimony that is important, it's the word of our brothers and sisters testimony that is important also. also. Who here has not been in a church meeting where somebody has shared a testimony of how God has worked in their life and it has not only blessed them, but it has blessed you as well. You've been encouraged in your faith. The reality of God has become much stronger as a result of that person's testimony. And so as we all individually share of how God has worked in our lives, we bolster our, our collective faith with one another and that collective faith uh, weakens the effects of the accuser in our lives. So the word of our testimony is a way that we overcome. But finally we're told that they overcome because they did not love their lives to death. And the third way the redeemed secure victory over the enemy's accusations is not through loving their life. Now this is a difficult thing to speak of because the love of life can be a snare. Paul said in Colossians 3 verse 3, For you died, and your life is hidden with Christ in God. And we might say yes and amen to that. Yes, my, I have died and my life is hidden with Christ. But is that truth a reality to you? Have you truly died to your old life? And I, is your life hidden with Christ? Or is it just a mere concept? I mean, we all know that all people die. It is the ultimate statistic. One in one people die. And Paul do, bids us reckon ourselves dead already, that our physical life is not something to be held on to, but rather live in the spiritual reality and for the spiritual reality that is Christ. But when it comes to the test, it can be a completely different thing. I was reading from the Open Doors website today that the persecution of Christians is getting more severe than ever, affecting increasing numbers of believers around the world. They were saying that a staggering 260 million Christians in the top 50 countries on the world watch list face high or extreme levels of persecution for their faith. 260 million. And Open Doors also estimates that there are a further 50 million Christians facing high levels of persecution in other 23 countries outside the top 50. So that's over 300 million Christians facing persecution in today's world. I find it hard to visualise what 30 million people are, but that amounts to people numbering four and a half times the population of the United Kingdom that's facing persecution in the world today because of their faith in Christ. And can you imagine what it's like facing that every day, whether it be threats and intimidation, injustice and indoctrination, physical harm, torture or even death? And if you desire to preserve your life in the face of such opposition and persecution, you will compromise and you will deny Christ because you'll do whatever it, does, it takes to preserve your life. But if, like it says here in Revelation, um, they, uh, I've lost my verse here, they did not love their lives to death. When persecution comes, because you do not love your life, you love Christ more, you'll be able to stand in the face of such persecution. You will not compromise. If you are willing to lay down your life for Christ when Satan threatens violence and death to the believer, then um, he will no longer uh, have control over you. Such a threat has no power. You know, this last year and a half has seen the world in the grip of fear. Fear that we might die of a disease called COVID-19. 
And even though the mortality rate is incredibly low, that fear has led to the nation being crippled. That is Satan's tactic with the church, to cripple her through fear. But if we do not love our life to, uh, to death, that fear will not have an effect on us or our fruitfulness for the Lord. Now, the matter of whether you do or don't love your life to death is not simply an issue that faces this 300 plus million of persecuted Christians in the world today. It's an issue that affects every believer in Christ. All believers are exalted in Romans 12 verse 1 to present your bodies a living sacrifice, holy and acceptable to God, which is your reasonable service. So it's not an act of an extremist or a fundamental Christian. It is your reasonable act of service to offer your bodies a living sacrifice. Paul said in 1 Corinthians 15 verse 31, I die daily. The true Christian should be dying, dying daily. When you come to the Lord in prayer, you die to what you want to do with your time and you sacrifice your time to the Lord. When you're faced with temptation, you die to what you want to do and you sacrifice your life to how the Lord would have you live. When you are presented with an opportunity to share your faith, you die to the discomfort that may cause you and the way it may affect your relationship with that person as you sacrifice your lips to the Lord and you open them up to speak of your faith. You see, we are all should be not be we should all be dying daily, not loving our life to death. And it is by not operating as uh, sorry, it's by operating as a living sacrifice. It is by dying daily that you do not love your life to death. Um, oh, sorry, that you yes. And if that is the way that you are living and operating today. When the day of persecution comes, and it is coming, you will have been prepared for that day. I would go so much to say is, if you are not overcoming through the blood of the Lamb, if you are not overcoming by the word of your testimony, and if you are not loving your life to death, then there's a question of whether you are part of the redeemed at all. Anyway, let's move on. I've strayed really quite far from the text. Let's go back. Verse 12. Therefore rejoice, O heavens, and you who dwell in them. Woe to the inhabitants of the earth and the sea. For the devil has come down to you, having great wrath, because he knows that he has a short time. So heaven rightly rejoices in the expulsion of Satan, but heaven's gain is earth's lost. The second response to Michael's victory is a cry of deep grief. Woe to the inhabitants of the earth and the sea. Now, this word here, woe here, is a word of deep grief. We've seen this word before uh, back in uh, Revelation chapters, uh, chapter 9, 9, where we saw the first and the second woe. The first and second woes were two demonic invasions that came upon the earth at the end of the first three and a half years of the tribulation. But this final woe is a third demonic invasion that hits the earth in that second half of the uh, tribulation, the last three and a half years. And the reason it is a more uh, powerful and fearful thing than the first two demonic attacks is because it is Satan and the entire demonic host. Satan throws everything he can at the world for these last three and a half years. Satan has been cast to the earth along with his angels and he knows he has but a little time allotted to him. Three and a half years and he operates with pure unadulterated wrath toward mankind. You know Satan was dealt a death blow at Calvary? Satan now receives a humiliating defeat at the hands of Michael the archangel. And so there is Satan hemorrhaging, death inevitable, writhing in pain, lashing out with hate, blind with rage, he is determined to go down with a blaze of glory and he seeks to take down everybody that he can with him. And we read about what he does in verse 13. Now when the dragon saw that he had been cast to the earth, he persecuted the woman who gave birth to the male child. We know that woman is Israel. But the woman was given two wings of a great eagle that she might fly into the wilderness to her place where she is nourished for a time and times and a half time from the presence of the serpent. So the serpent spewed water out of his mouth like a flood after the woman that he might cause her to be carried away by the flood. But the earth helped the woman and the earth opened its mouth and swallowed up the flood with the dragon 
which the dragon had spewed out of his mouth. The dragon's anger is now directed towards the woman. And we will see that Satan will specifically target the nation of Israel during the last half of the tribulation. There will be a tremendous surge in anti-Semitism in those days. And the principal agent through whom the dragon will persecute Israel is the Antichrist. And although the Antichrist is present through the whole seven years, his true colours will only be revealed at the midpoint when he enters the newly constructed temple in Jerusalem, sets himself up as God and operates a one world government from Jerusalem. And he will use that power to persecute the Jewish people. Now, we'll learn more about the Antichrist in Revelation chapter 13. But to suffice to say, it will dawn on Israel that they have lived in false security for those first three and a half years and they will now flee for their lives into the wilderness. Now, these events spoken of here that uh, in the latter half of chapter 12 of Revelation uh, were formerly spoken of by Jesus Christ himself in Matthew chapter 24. Matthew chapter 24 is the Olivet Discourse. And here Jesus answers a question of his disciples about what things would happen in the future. If I just read to you from Matthew 24, verse 15, we start here at the midpoint of the tribulation where um, not only does uh, the Antichrist set up his throne and set himself up as God in the temple, but there's an idol there called the abomination of desolation that he sets up in the temple as well. And it says, verse 15 of Matthew 24, Therefore, when you see the abomination of desolation spoken of by Daniel the prophet standing in the holy place, whoever reads, let him understand, then let those who are in Judea flee to the mountains. Let him who is on the housetop not come down to take anything out of his house, and let him who is in the field not go back to his clothes. But woe to those who are pregnant and to those with nursing babies in those days, and pray that your flight may not be in winter or on the Sabbath. For then there will be great tribulation, such as not been seen since the beginning of the world until this time, nor ever shall be. And if those days had not been shortened, no flesh would be saved. But for the elect's sake, those days will be shortened. We see here the same events being spoken of. And why does it say if those days had not been shortened, no flesh would be saved? But for the elect's sake, those days will be shortened. Well, such is the murderous rage of Satan. He will take all of mankind down with him if he can, including all of God's elect, which is namely Israel, spoken of in this context. Now, the Lord always has a remnant of his elect people, Israel, upon the earth. And if this group of elect were destroyed by Satan, then what Paul spoke of in Romans eleven twenty six cannot come to pass. Namely, all Israel will be saved. So God sets this time short so that Satan cannot have the full vent of his anger. And while John tells us in Revelation 12, 14, Israel will flee to the wilderness, Jesus elaborates upon this in Matthew 24 to verse 16, because he says those in Judea will flee to the mountains. Now, Judea was the southern part of Israel. Jerusalem is in the northeast of Judea, and so the flight would have to be south. Now, south of Judea takes you into the wilderness of the Negev. And in the wilderness of the Negev, you have the Negev Mountains. Historically, this is the ancient territory of the nation Edom. That area is now known as Jordan. And in those mountains is a place called Petra, which biblically is referred to as Bosra. You'll probably recognise Petra from something like Indiana Jones and the Last Crusade, where they went and they found the Holy Grail was hidden in that uh, place built into the rock face. The Holy Grail was not there. The Holy Grail does not exist, but that place does. It's Petra and it's part of a, a larger citadel of various different buildings, which are hard to get to because they're concealed within the mountains. And it is highly likely that this is where the place pre is prepared for. Sorry, the Lord, this is the place that the Lord prepared for his people Israel to flee to during the second half of the tribulation. And within this network of mountains and ancient dwellings, there the Lord will supernaturally protect and provide for his people. We are told that the woman was given two wings of a great eagle. Now, this terminology, wings of an eagle, 
should cast our minds back to the book of Exodus, specifically Exodus 19 verse 4, because it is language drawn from the Exodus of Israel from Egypt. It says there in Exodus 19 verse 4, You have seen what I did to the Egyptians, and how I bore you on eagles' wings and brought you to myself. This use of Exodus language not only draws our minds back to that time, but draws a parallel to those times, between those days and these future days. Just as the Lord provided and protected Israel back in the days of the Exodus, so the Lord will provide and protect for Israel in the days of the Great Tribulation. Just as the Lord supernaturally provided for Israel during the Exodus, he will supernaturally provide for Israel during the Great Tribulation. Just as the Lord supernaturally protected Israel during the uh, Exodus, he will supernaturally protect them during the Tribulation. Let's look at that provision. It says there in our verses, uh, she, where, where she is nourished for a times uh, and times and a half time. That is a reference to three and a half years. The Lord will nourish Israel for three and a half years. Now, this will not be the first time, of course, Israel has been in a wilderness and she's been supernaturally provided for by the Lord. During Israel's 40 years in the wilderness, between slavery in Egypt and entering the promised land, the Lord daily provided manna from heaven, quail from the sky, water from a rock. And there is no reason why the Lord could not do this again. We know that the Lord supernaturally provided for Elijah in the wilderness with water from the brook Cherith and with food from ravens. God has got good form in providing for his people in the wilderness. And we will see this again at this period of time in history. But we also see God's supernatural protection from the presence of the serpent. Now, this is a little bit hard to understand, and I don't know that I've got a complete grasp of it. But it says there in verse 15, the serpent spewed water out of his mouth like a flood after the woman, that he might cause her to be carried away by the flood. Now, this might be some form of literal flood. I'm not 100 percent sure. Certainly uh, in the same way that um, Pharaoh tried to uh, drown all the Israeli boys in the in the Nile in Egypt is a picture that is being drawn from here. And if the two witnesses have power to send fire from their mouths, why is it so hard to believe that Satan isn't able to generate water to try and flood out or wash out uh, Israel? Satan certainly comes in like a flood. But what is evident is against this supernatural attack from Satan, the Lord provides a supernatural defence. He opens up the earth and the water is swallowed or consumed. Now this brings my mind back to the rebellion of Korah during Israel's time in the wilderness. When a rebellion of 3,000 of Israelis led by Korah tried to usurp power from Moses and turn Israel back to Egypt. Now such an act of taking Israel back to Egypt would have almost certainly meant the annihilation of Israel. But the Lord judged Korah and the rebellion by opening up the earth and swallowing them. The Lord saved Israel by opening up the earth and swallowing the uh, source of opposition. And the Lord will open up the earth and swallow up the form of attack again here during the second half of the tribulation. And then our final verse here is, And the dragon was enraged with the woman, and he went to make war with the rest of her offspring, who keep the commandments of God and have the testimony of Jesus Christ. Here we see that Satan the dragon is so enraged, so angered with the fact that he cannot get to the woman because she is protected by the Lord, that he turns around and he goes to make war with the rest of her offspring. Who are the rest of her offspring? Well, it is none other than believers in Jesus Christ. It is the tribulation saints who are alive during these days. These are those who keep the commandments of God. These are those who have the testimony of Jesus Christ. And we will see that anybody who puts their faith in Jesus will be on the run for their life. There will be an underground movement during these last three and a half years. And we will see a little bit more of the persecution that this, um, this group of tribulation saints will experience when we get into chapter 13, where we see the mark of the beast, the inability to be able to buy or sell food they will live in devastating uh, poverty during this period of time. 
But we can be sure that just as God supernaturally protects and provides for Israel, he will supernaturally protect and provide his people. And we see that Jesus Christ is the same today as he was yesterday and is forever. He will provide for us and he will protect us. The question is, are we included in the redeemed of the Lord? Are we those who rely upon the blood of the Lamb? Are we those who have a testimony of the Lord Jesus Christ upon which we can lean upon in our lives? Are we those who don't love our lives to death? Are we those willing to be living sacrifices for the Lord? We'll carry on in chapters 13 uh, to look at the beast from the sea and the beast from the land. These are two further signs, speaking of the Antichrist and the false prophet, two key, further key figures who will be in operation in these last three and a half years uh, next time. But for now, let's close with a word of prayer. Father God, there's a lot of information here and um, I just pray that you would confirm your word to people. Uh, Lord, you would help us to be those that truly lean and rely upon the sacrifice of Jesus, that we would be those who um, are willing to lay down our lives in service for you, knowing, Lord, that you will provide for us and that you will protect us. Lord, help us to lean upon those everlasting arms that we might be secure in you, we ask in Jesus' name. Amen.